And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. We are streaming live at KFAR660.com. And, of course, on the airwaves in Fairbanks, Alaska at 660 on your AM dial. A couple of different ways you can get on the program. One is by joining us in the chat room at KFAR660.com. I'm completing the sign-in process even as we speak. Now, the sign-in, it's not a password protected sign in you don't need a membership or anything all you need is a user handle so you can come into the chat room as whoever you'd like to be today and we'd be happy to talk with you there at kfar660.com the other way of course is by calling in to our phone lines at 458 talk if you're outside of the immediate area code make sure you drop on a 907 first you know we've got some folks that listen down in anchorage and juno idaho as far as i believe we've got a listener out there in virginia at least one so uh, 907-458-TALK is the number if you'd like to get on the program this morning. You know, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of stories that right out of the box I'm very uh, interested in seeing. One of them is this uh, military exercise in South Florida in which basically you've got the military and the police teaming up and storming a building in the middle of the night. I was told it was just an exercise, of course, the explosions and the gunfire and everything else that had people kind of concerned, and they uh, had a deluge of 911 calls from the Department of Defense, but instead of asking why the military would be terrifying American citizens on U.S. soil with drills designed to acclimate the public to accept martial law, the local news station framed it as a cool tourist story. Welcome to the program. Joining me in the studio from Far North Tactical, one of the sponsors of the program, Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Aaron, did I hear you and say good morning? Good morning, Oh, Steve. there you go. Now I got you. And uh, from Bighorn Enterprises, the other sponsor of the program, it's uh, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. All right. Good to have you gentlemen here. Oh, uh, we've got some other folks there in the background. I don't know if they're just uh, going to be observing or are they going to be participating today because if they're participating, we need to get them up to a microphone. Only if they're mad. All right. Good morning, one and all. Oh, I, the story I mentioned right out of the box here today, this issue of uh, military exercises on American soil. Do you think it's just a matter of some kind of a uh, cool partnership, as the local radio or TV station was making it out to be, uh, between the military and the police, or is it actually something that's actually designed to get us acclimated to living within a militarized police state? What do you think? Is that too harsh a question to ask? All right. See the gears turning, a little smoke coming out from between the air. <laughs> Josh is about three hours late today, so. <laughs> All right. Drove to the front gate and it's closed. Had to go around. All right, because of the uh, the military parade that's going on. Yeah, yeah. Starts, well, 6, late. starts at 10, o- 10 o'clock, right over there at the old uh, the old starting point for the Golden Days Parade, the, the main gate of Fort Wainwright. Yeah, so if you are in Fairbanks, rest assured that your travel plans will be disrupted today. And if you live on post. Badger or trainer. Those are the only two gates open. Main gate is closed. Gotcha. All right. So uh, I'll go back to the the question. Do you see the story here? This is a story out of Florida. There was a middle-of-the-night raid in which uh, military and police together stormed an apartment building, and they framed it as if it was nothing more than just an exercise um, and passed it off as it's it's uh, some kind of an anti-terrorism cooperation between the military and the police. Now, the fact that it's happening on American soil doesn't seem to concern anybody except for the extreme wackos, as people like to categorize those who believe in the Constitution and that whole concept of not using U.S. military against our own citizens here on our soil. I saw that same story in uh, L.A., I think, couple months ago. Kind of interesting. Well, there's, uh, that, I think they would at least tell people what's going on, because you know, when it happened in L.A., they were freaked out, black helicopter flying around, <laughs> landing, jumping off, landing on buildings, I think. The guys were rappelling out, jumping in, jumping out, freaked people out, thought we were going down or something. Well, here, here in Fairbanks, I know that we've had the military... Uh, We've had a couple of exercises in which military helicopters have gone over the Fairbanks area tracking vehicles through the urban area, and it's one of those things where there was advance notice, and they put out to the public, hey, we're going to be having an exercise, 
You see a military helicopter going over the neighborhoods of Fairbanks. Do not be alarmed. It is only an exercise. We are simply seeing how our capabilities are of tracking a vehicle through an urban area. And we've already got that vehicle marked, so don't worry. We're not tracking you. But, I mean, they did give advance notice of that. And so when it did happen, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, however, it does, it, I don't know. It just it seems like the lines are getting more and more blurred lately in terms of what the politicians are asking the military to do and what the military is willing to do. Because, I mean, when I was in, back in the early 90s, there was still a very firm sense that there are certain orders that must not be obeyed because they, vol- they, they violate the Constitution. There are certain things that simply must not be done, no matter who it is giving you the command, whether it is your immediate supervisor, your company commander, your commander-in-chief, there are certain things that are, are just simply unlawful orders, and you will not do them. Now, I don't know if that's not being taught anymore or if it's being swept under the rug, but we all know from the Nuremberg trials that it is not a defense. You cannot say, I was just simply following orders. You have to be able to make that moral judgment call about whether or not you're going to follow an order that goes against what you feel is right. Yeah, this this is kind of stupid, actually. There are, the citizens of Coconut Grove were awoken at 1 a.m. to the sound of simulated gunfire and explosions by military helicopters hovering over buildings and dispatch troops on the ground. That's a little bit overboard, I'd say. I'm just throwing well, that out there. there was, I mean, if they don't know about it, of course people are going to freak out about it. I mean, if that happened here... You know, we're sitting here right now, and all of a sudden these helicopters flew in. Da, 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 and bow, boom, boom. I know Aaron would be on the floor like two seconds. Bam. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably just be sitting there by the window, sipping my coffee, watching it, and, and my jaded PTSD kicking in. And you're like, oh, it's another beautiful day for napalm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, who knows why they're doing this? I mean, of course, it's all for our safety and uh, the war on terrorism. So they can do whatever they want. They will do whatever they want. With the war on terrorism, pretty much. Uh, well, uh, you know, the, the main purpose of this program and the Patriots Lament that starts in, at 10 oh, o'clock. Totally different show. Completely though. different program, exactly. The, the main reason for both of these hours on a Saturday morning is not simply for us to hear the sound of our own voice, although it is rather comforting. The the, the point of, of these programs is to get people to think and to start questioning what has happened to the Constitution? What has happened to the concept of liberty? Where is liberty these days? And it, is the state legitimate? Is the uh, the actuality that we have a state, is that a legitimate piece of reality? And why do we have a government? More and more and more, I ask myself that all the time. I just listened to a pretty cool speech by Hans Hamann Happy. <laughs> on uh, <laughs> democracy, the God that failed. I listened to it three times over the last day because it's so good. And he uh, he's asking the legitimacy of government. What is government legitimate to have? Because and he compares them to uh, our Western democracies to uh, monarchies. And uh, the protections that you had under a monarch versus a democracy, you were way better off having a monarch because you had a 50-50 chance the guy was either good or bad. And the monarch had inherently, he wanted to pass his uh, monarchy on to his son. So normally he wouldn't make too many bad decisions that would hurt his people. I mean, obviously they did because they were bad people. But mostly he would work towards furthering his kingdom his lands, his people, so it would be passed on to the next, his prince or whatever. Keep the heritage in the family. Keep the the monarchy in the family. Where today we have a guy that gets voted in for four years, and the only thing, only incentive he has is what can I get in four years? Well, I, I don't know. That's not necessarily true. I mean, remember when Governor uh, Murkowski appointed his daughter to his vacant Senate seat? <laughs> I mean, there there well, is still a, there is <laughs> there is still a certain uh, going on. well a, a certain sense of providing for your family business, which is the way some of these politicians view their right to rule us. Well, you look at uh, one of the things that uh, okay, the founders said that the only reason to have classical liberalism was 
The only reason to have government was to protect private property. And you hear the quotes every time, every Saturday, we have a couple, two or three of them that talk about private property and the role of government is nothing but to protect the property. The problem is, the same time that they're supposedly there to protect the property, where do they get their funds to operate from your private property? So you kind of have this... Uh, Give me one example where that's happening. You, I don't believe that. <laughs> so you have mm-hmm. our government is there to protect property. This being the end of government, blah, blah, blah. No, this being the end of good government. Good government, right. But at the same time, the only way they can function is to tax your property and to steal your property to protect your property. So the only uh, function of good government is one to protect private property, so... The only good government's no government. The only good government would have to be no government. I mean, because even with the protections, property protections, if we look at our last 200 years, are we more protected in our property now than we were 200 years ago? Absolutely not. But have our taxes increased exponentially to pay for that protection? Absolutely. Well, just just look at the borough alone, just here locally in Fairbanks. We've seen our property taxes go up, well, I believe, what, 30, 30% in the last 10 years? And we have seen the size of the borough government, the spending, has grown even more than that. I, I'm, I have to get the figures out and, and actually look at them. But if you look at where things were when the borough was formed back in the 60s and the limited scope of which the borough government was supposed to take care of, and how it has grown, and how more and more and more uh, things have been added to their list to do. And and they haven't been added by out-of-control borough assemblies coming in and saying, we are going to rule your life. They've been added because people have gone and petitioned the borough and saying, there ought to be a rule against this. My neighbor has an ugly piece of property, and he's got blue tarps on it, and it looks like a junkyard, and you need to clean it up. And this is where we've gotten most of the rules that have become so onerous. And in terms of our property taxes, I mean, they have to have some way to pay, pay for all of those employees, right? Josh, if we didn't have government, people would kill each other and rob each other, and there would be nothing left. Um, yeah, I, yeah, right now, I'm, <laughs> that could be true. People would kill each other. There's always going to be bad people. Unfortunately, when you have government, bad people are the government. What? Because bad people want to be in government. When you have a king, your king says, hey, I already own all this land. And, you know, he wants to go out and get more land for here and there. But it, he's always stopped by a more powerful king. That's the only thing that stops him. He's like, Oop. okay, this guy's got more guns than I do, so I'm going to stop. When you got government, you get a guy elected, he wants your property. There's nothing stopping him at all. He can tax you all he wants. He can do eminent domain. They can do whatever they want. And when you get the have-nots, there's always people. That, there's always more have-nots than there are the havers. Just <laughs> holy Hello? Toledo! What was that? That is the uh, ringer going off on our hotline. I don't know why it got bumped over there to ringer instead of just flasher. I thought we were going down right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's always more have-nots, right? So in your democracy, when the people figure it out, well, hey, I can vote for whatever. If I vote for so-and-so, he's a pretty bad guy. He's going to give me everything I want. So have-nots vote in the people that they want so the people that produce get screwed every single time. Welcome to America. Welcome to democracy. Yeah. I mean, democracy. that is the pattern of democracy from the very beginning. It has always been the idea that the, the, the whole concept of majority rule Steel. is that we can get together and decide what to do with everybody else. I mean, if you look at just the texting ban that put was put into that was signed into law on Thursday and went into effect yesterday. The very fact the fact that they banned texting while driving. Oops. Means that uh basically they have now criminalized a behavior which in the the Alaska legislature. Oh. Even though it was um, perfectly legal, may have not made the wisest thing to do, but it was perfectly legal on Thursday when, he, when the governor signed that law as of Friday, it is now a crime to either text or read a text while driving in, mm-hmm. in the state of Alaska. And now here's the thing, the, the kicker, is that back in 2008 they tried to pass similar legislation, but they didn't use the word text. And a magistrate in Kenai said, you can't enforce this because it's not specific. If you intend to prohibit the behavior, 
you need to specify the behavior you wish to in you intend to prohibit. Oh, well, they do. No, no, but now think about that for just a moment. That that <laughs> magistrate that magistrate said basically explicitly that the legislature has the power to of ban whatever activity they want to. Let's take let's take it way deeper with what I was telling you about. Okay, let's take it way deeper. Okay, the exact same concept. I went to uh I had to go to court the other day to cut an ankle monitor off of a kid. Uh he was 20 years old. He was getting he got sentenced to 35 years in prison for sleeping with an underage girl. Okay? Now everybody that was in the uh courtroom with me was all basically stoning him in their minds all around me because he'd slept with an underage girl, right? At the court trial, she was 17 years old and he was 20. Uh, when they were together, I believe she was 14 and he was um, 18. And she was uh, old enough because the legal age of consent is 16. Her, you know, that's when they consider a child an adult in Alaska. She was able to get on the stand and say her piece and she got up there and she said, I love him. I've been waiting for two years for you guys to let him out of jail so we could be together. He said the exact same thing when he's got his turn to talk, is that he'd been waiting for two years just to get out of jail to be with her. Right? So you have, it's the same kind of ideology there. The state decided what was moral and what was right. They didn't get to decide what was moral and what was right. The parents pressed the charges against him. I thought he brought up a really good point. He said that he'd been seeing her for a year and a half. Not like they just met one time and the parents caught him. He met her at the place called the Bounce House, which is a place where underage kids come together. It's kind of like a bar-type atmosphere, but without alcohol, of course, where they come and they meet together and find a party to go to and whatnot. And he made a really good point. He said, I met her uh, where I was with her for a year and a half. We met at the Bounce House, and she would come over afterwards. We would go to the bowling alleys, and we'd go to the movies together. Now, a judge gave that guy 35 years in prison, but he was with her for a year and a half before her parents knew. If anybody was going to go to prison, who should have went to prison? I got an age of consent law at my house. It's five 12 gauge shotguns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, going... hey, hold, hold on. Let me let me go all the way with it. Go ahead. If I went down to Idaho, the age of consent is 17. The age of consent in Oregon, I believe, is 18. The age of consent in Japan is only 12 years old. So if I went down on the Oregon-Idaho border and I put one foot on one side and one foot on the other, I just have to lean one way or the other for my morals to change. Now, the people that are sitting there under that rule, like when I was in the courtroom up here, she was 15, and on every side of me they were saying, piece of crap, piece of crap, piece of crap. But if we were in Idaho and she was 16, the same people would be calling him a piece of crap. Because we let the state decide what's moral and what's right. Me and uh, Josh and I's great-grandma got married at the age of 13. I'd like somebody to call up and um, say something nasty about her so I could knock her teeth out. I mean, just think about it. Who decides what's moral? We let the state decide what's moral. We Thir- put- 35 years in prison, and both of them pled to the state to just be together. And yet people are constantly petitioning the state to enforce their own morals. Look at this, uh, the ban on gay marriage, for instance. Oh, personally, I, I don't like anything about homosexuality. It is not my choice. It is not something that I think is a good, healthy lifestyle. Are you sure, Steve? Oh, well, only with you. However, <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Uh, please, I'm not going to kiss you, Aaron. The, the point of it is this, that if we are going to enforce our own personal morality on other people, where does it stop? Well, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking, I'm going way farther to the fact that we let the state decide what's right and what's wrong, and then we take it on ourselves as that is what's moral, right? Well, it's what the Puritans did, right? I mean, back, way back in the founding of our country, the, the 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 Puritans and the colonies on the what it was it Massachusetts, they were known for basically enforcing their own personal moral beliefs as law in their colony. That's where we get the word puritanical. 
Hey, the, the argument to that is obviously, well, what would you do if you, what would you say if it was your daughter? You know, what what would you say, Josh, if it was your daughter? I just did. I got five 12 gauge shotguns. It's pretty simple. <laughs> I'm responsible for her. Right. So, <laughs> so wait, wait. Are it, you saying that your daughter wouldn't be going out and hooking up with some stranger at some place? And, uh-huh. and, and knowing what, and you wouldn't know what's going on behind your back exactly. for two and a half years? That's my biggest point. Is he pointed out that for a year and a half he'd been seeing her. A year and a half. And so she's been spending the night with him and all that. And her parents were the ones that bringing charges against him. So think about it like this. Let's say that it was the aunt. Like, you know, the girl's aunt had brought charges against the guy, and the parents didn't. And she decided to bring charges against the parents. Would they have been most likely jailed also? You bet they would have, because the only person that's a victim, or the only person that's in the right, is the one that brings the charges in this justice system that we supposedly have. Yeah, and it should have been, I mean... Because there is a consent law is why people don't take care of their kids because the government gone do it for me. Right. So the only time you get upset is when you get embarrassed and then you're gonna go preach charges against people. But the fact of the matter is, parents, if they have a problem, they need to know where their daughter is in the first place. So advocating Hello. for uh, for the law in the first place is basically giving over consent to the government to decide what's moral and decide to take care of your kids. Yeah. What if the government changes the age of consent to 12? In Japan, they did. What if they did here? I mean, people would, eh. Well, I don't know. I mean, Does that take away your parental right not to let your daughter go out with someone that's 50 years old yes, because she's it does. 13? Absolutely. Yes, it does. It takes away because she has consent to from the state. In the, well, they already have that, though. The, the state has already said that a child under the age of 16, if she gets pregnant, can go and get an abortion without your consent, without your knowledge. And that is the law of the land. Does that make that moral? Right, but the same people that are fighting that are okay with there being a uh, 16-year-old age of consent law. Well, that's because people want the government to take care of them. But they don't that's want a... the government to be involved. But they do. That's what democracy is all. About. That's what democracy is all about. You get the government involved to force your opinions on someone else. If you don't like it, then by golly, you elect the guy. He goes in there and he passes laws. He passes no texting laws, which are stupid, uh-huh. which we've talked about in the past with the like in the book uh, Whatever Happened to Justice. Those kind of laws are stupid. They aren't real laws because someone else can come in and change it. All you got to do it? is get enough people that agree with you to go down and get a mob big enough to go right up there to the borough assembly and get them to change whatever and go out and prosecute your neighbor for. I don't know about those guys over there. I think they're too stupid even to listen to a mob. Oh mob. yeah, they they just decided to go ahead and fund the uh to put funding back into the budget for the animal shelter. I know. They listened. A lot of people they listened to the mob and they're against it. No, there weren't. Most of the people who testified at the borough uh, budget meeting were for the an increase could put money back in for the animal shelter and they and they put the pressure on the borough assembly by bringing that lovely emotional display of dog collars good old democracy so, so because you know what it is it is one of those constitutional rights to have the the animals that you care about get paid for with other people's money yeah well it just the biggest thing to me is it depends on what state you're in is how your morals are set true if you can go from state to state and your morals change, it obviously isn't a real law, is it? New. Let's see who's on the hotline real quick. 458-TALK is weird. the number. Good morning. Who's this? Hey, it's Josh. How you doing? Hey, Josh. Good. What's on your mind? Uh, well, man, you guys talk uh, quite a bit. Um, when I lived in Brooklyn, there was an interesting case about two 12-year-old girls that lived in the uh, Hasidic Jewish community and that they had decided they didn't want to be a part of that community anymore. So they hopped on a bus made it all the way to Arizona, uh, got jobs, 12 years old, don't know how they did it, uh, got an apartment and like homesteaded for six months, right? Paid all the bills, had the job and everything. And they finally were found out and the state of New York uh, took custody of them. And so they're like in this weird limbo. I I think they're probably just turning 18 right about now, but uh, where they were captured by the state of New York they weren't allowed to live with their parents anymore because they made it six months on their own at 12 years old. It was just kind of an interesting, you guys were talking about ages of consent and, you know, making your own choices. It, this is, they're at this weird intersection where they're obviously capable of taking care of themselves, right? They did it for six months in a state where they knew no one. 
But at the same time, it's like there's overlapping claims on who gets to make the decisions for them. And I wonder what your thoughts would be on a situation like that. Yeah, that's an excellent Hang question. On. And we'll uh, take a stab at that after the break. 458 Talk is the number if you'd like to get on the program. This is the Saturday morning wake up call right here on KFAR's local talk radio. Join us in the chat room at KFAR660.com. Welcome back to the Saturday morning wake up call right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, 660 on your AM dial. If you recognize that song in the background there, it's Rage Against the Machine, Bulls on Parade. One of my favorite lines in that song. Rally around the family with a pocket full of shells. I don't know if that ties in at all to any of our uh, discussion yet this morning. Uh, but we've been talking here a little bit about age of consent laws and how they vary from state to state and what makes it moral. And, and what makes it, you know, at what point are you making a moral choice and at what point are you simply obeying the law? What it, where, does, where does the line between crime and sin get drawn? And, and then the question, of course, right before the break, Josh, you want to address that? Well, I was going to have Josh restate it again. Tell, tell us what you... Yeah, um, when I lived in Brooklyn, uh, I was right next door to a uh, real ultra-Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. And the opportunities for women in that neighborhood are pretty limited. And a couple of 12-year-old friends that were part of that community managed girls, to escape. 12-year-old girls? Yeah, 12-year-old girls. Yeah, they managed to escape from their parents. They, they hopped a bus. They'd been saving some money. And they uh, ended up making it all the way out to Arizona. And both of them got jobs. They rented an apartment. They, I don't know how they did all this. It was a, a big write-up in the uh, paper. And uh, they were there for about six months before the, uh, the, the authorities finally caught up to them. And uh, they were brought back to New York by uh, state officials there. But instead of being returned to the parents, they were kept uh, as wards of the state. And it was, it, they were in this weird legal limbo where they weren't allowed to be on their own. They weren't given back to their parents. They were essentially prisoners of the state. They got to see their folks on the weekends. But it, it was just interesting. They obviously young, 12 years old, right? But they had the capability to hold down a job, get an apartment, and take care of themselves. They didn't want to be part of the community anymore, the Jewish community. But at the same time, they were just, it's like this weird intersection of parental rights versus your individual rights versus state control. And I wondered what you guys thought about the situation. Well, didn't the, didn't the parents give up that right under the same type of laws that made a age of consent in the first place that's how the state's able to just take the children because they owned them in the first place yeah you know if it with with this particular community it's kind of bizarre because uh like borough police like for brooklyn won't go into the hasidic com- community there they have their own police they have their own sets of laws it's kind of enforced it's it's almost like being in a different country as a matter of fact it's kind of a scary neighborhood to walk through at night but uh, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's like a completely different situation. Yeah, that's a hard one. I know uh, I've read Rothbard talks about uh, a child's rights, basically just to uh, has the right to pack up and go if he feels like he can do it. I don't yeah. really wrap myself around that one. I, I'm still on the parental rights part, I guess, just because I have kids. But I definitely the, – the biggest problem is uh, – the third entity that you're talking about, you said the you know, individual rights, the parental rights, and then the state, mm-hmm. the third party it, that always is involved in everything we do, the state. Yeah, it seems to me, well, let's let's pretend the girls made an accommodation with their parents, right? Like the parents realized we get it. Maybe we've been being too strict. We can work it out. And even if the girls wanted to go back and the parents you know, were willing to take them, they were disallowed. Right. right. They they ended up being wards of the state for uh, what are they twelve, four, six years at least. Wow. Thanks for the call, Josh. I mean, I definitely yeah, no I don't see uh, the ward of the state parts the part I don't agree with. Well, and, and you have to ask the question: and who is who's teaching the values, and whose values are being inculcated in, in terms of the children? With your own children, if your own children take a look at your values and they take a look at what you're teaching them and they say, no, not for me, then perhaps you have not done a good job of inculcating your values. You know, and now, whereas if you look at the, the state is very effective. You send the, your kids off to the public schools. They've got, what, eight hours a day in which they have to be, they, they're basically forced to sit in a wooden, you know, well, not necessarily a wooden chair, but they're, they're forced to sit in a chair and listen to the preaching 
day in and day out, eight hours a day by the state about what is right and what is wrong. These are the values that you will have. Now, if you think that if for a moment that what is going on in the public schools has anything to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic, just take a look at what comes out the other end. What is what is being matric- matriculated right now? Those who are being passed off as high school graduates, are they capable of doing basic math? Are they capable of writing an essay that is understandable by other than third year or you know, third graders? No, and it just all these conversations from consent to school, this and that, individuals, parental rights, it all comes it's it's one conversation really. It's all about should the state be involved in any of that in the first place? No. No. It should not be involved in any of that. It should not be involved in, I mean, it shouldn't be around in the first place. It shouldn't be involved in the education. It shouldn't be involved in the protecting your quote-unquote children. Because, I mean, how many times do they protect your children or take your children? We see that all the time, the abuse of that power. How, And the state shouldn't be involved in the marriage license thing. I mean, you brought up the homosexual marriage or whatever, and uh, we got to... Email was passed around. Everyone's freaking out because Obama said that he supports gay marriage now. Who cares? And everyone wants to get up in arms and say, oh, we got to fight. You know, the, what is it, the Marriage Protection Act or something like that mm-hmm. they want to pass or the Constitutional Ar- Amendment. Or... Already been passed nationally. And oh, that's being, right. Uh, but... But, and, and here in Alaska, too, I believe we have a Constitutional Amendment already on the books that says that marriage is to be between one man and one woman. Right. Well, the problem with that is that uh, the w- the way to get rid of being up in arms about it and worried about it is just get rid of marriage licenses. But if, if the <laughs> state doesn't intervene and tell you who you can have permission to marry, then you're going to have people getting married to all kinds of weirdos. Who cares? Yeah. You the, might have undesirable the, people getting married, Josh. Like blacks and whites. I know. Well, the not funny, just that. I mean, you might have mentally it. retarded people getting married. You have You have the homosexual community crying for recognition from the state to license them. And then you have the other side screaming that they don't want the state to to sanctify the marriage by licensing it. If I was a homosexual, which I'm not, Steve, so don't hit on me. If I was a homosexual, I don't think that, I think I would be blessed in the fact that the state wouldn't be sanctifying me. I don't believe the state has the power to sanctify anything. Well, the reason that it? they do it is Isn't because that a religious you term? get a government monopolized benefit when you get that marriage oh, license. Oh, that's right. It's you a do, government don't. benefit monopolized by the government. So basically, give us the power to regis- register you as a married couple. Give us the power to consent that you be married and we'll give you this benefit. So why do the homosexuals want to have a, a marriage license? Because they want part of that government monopolized benefit. Take away the benefit, no one's going to want the license. Take away the benefit, who cares? I, I don't have a marriage license. I've been married for 19 years. What? And I've been able to function through society, a little bit weird, but if we take away that, if the conservatives, the Christians out there would say, you know what, the state does not have the right to say whether I may or may not be married. The colonist, the king or the parliament passed, I think it was in the 1750s, they passed the marriage tax, basically a marriage license. A license is a tax. Mm-hmm. And the colonists said, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. They actually took up arms and went and beat up the people that were trying <laughs> to pass the tax. They beat them up, forcibly beat them up. Take and it back no farther. one, no one would buy the tax. So guess what they had to do? Rescind it. Rescind it. Take it back farther. Does anyone recall a fellow by the name of St. Valentine? Day? No, not, well, the, the, the person for whom we have Valentine's Day, what he got in trouble for, what he got martyred for, was marrying people without the state's blessing. Because the state, in this case, Rome, intervened and said, we will not be issuing any marriage licenses. No one has the permission to get married because we're at a time of war. And therefore, we will not allow anyone to be married. We will not give our permission. Yeah. Valentine said, you don't have the right to determine whether people have can get married or not. This is something between a man and a woman and God, or whoever. This is this is something that, this is a, sanctum, a, a sacrament of the church. This is not a government issue. And so he went ahead and married people without the state's blessing. That got him thrown in jail and murdered. Well, if you take the... Uh because I know there's some irreligious people out there. You can take the uh, religious part of it and just look at it basically as a contract. It's a contract between two people. I agree, such and such. 
I agree such and such. You have a contract. And then why do you want to have a third party? Why do we always have to have the third party called the state involved in every stinking thing we do? And how many contracts out there that the state is involved with versus how many there aren't? I mean, do you want the government involved in every single contract you have? Every single time you hire somebody to come over to your house to mow your lawn, you have to have a state-sponsored contract for it? Yes. Well, if you have a marriage license and the state's a third party, then don't they, by definition, have jurisdiction over your children? They are the product of the contract, aren't right. they? Right, and the state's part of the contract. There's three entities involved, the which man, is, the woman, and the state. Which is so what gives the, right, the state the right to step in and take the children away right. if the parties of the contract are not fulfilling their... If the state decides mm-hmm. that they're not fulfilling their part of the contract, the state automatically usurps jurisdiction over the children, over your marriage, over your whole life. There goes your 12-year-olds. And we're worried about homosexuals getting the marriage license. How about just say... If we just stood up and said, no more marriage license, the issue's gone. Because the state's not issuing licenses anymore. I think it's interesting if you go back to what Steve just said about uh, St. Valentine and Rome and everything. The whole reason that that Rome was not recognizing marriages had nothing to do with the fact that Rome didn't think it was important to recognize marriages. It had to do with the fact that Rome was at war. And it's really easy to take men who are single and don't have families and send them off to war and let them die because there's no quote-unquote moral... Uh, hazard there. Where if you take a man who's married, who has, you know, le- a legitimate tie to an individual who they can't send to war, it makes it way easier to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, why are you sending this guy off to war? He has a family. So if you don't recognize marriage, if the state doesn't, chooses not to recognize marriage between individuals, then it makes it way, I mean, you, they've just removed all moral hazard for... Yeah. Do, do me a favor, Rod, and tell us your name, because well, I didn't introduce you before. My name is uh, Abe. I guess it's okay to use my real name, right? Chat ball, well, if you want to. You can use <laughs> Only it. Only if you want to get on the list. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm already on the list. <laughs> you somewhere. had to already be on the list somewhere. We All got right. a couple extra hoodlums in here today, and they're, they're free to chat if they feel, but so far they're just... Okay, so my name's Abe. I, I promised I wasn't going to talk until my blood pressure started to rise. And, well, <laughs> well, we, we got you up. His All ears right. are red. All right, now, are you a silent partner in this? Who's that back there? Oh, uh, this is Jeremiah. I think that the interesting thing on the on this discussion is that you hear the contradiction from the quote unquote conservatives in the media. You've got all these folks that t- rail against democracy and talk about how we're a republic and we shouldn't be mob rule, majority rule. But then if you listen to the conservative talking heads this week, and they they talk about this this gay marriage issue and they say, well, the majority of people look, we've voted down this issue in all these different states by a majority vote. And I, I always thought that wasn't the point of a republic to protect the voice of the minority and not just to use the majority as a beating stick. So Only when it's working good for you. It just it, it depends on if you elect the right people. In, in <laughs> if it's working out for you, then democracy's sweet. If it's not, then... Yeah, Republic sounds a little better. Go back to two weeks ago when Obama, in his address, said that we need to give sovereignty back to the Afghan people. And if we don't give them their sovereignty, all of our efforts there were for nothing. And he got railed and tore apart by the right and the Mark Levins and Sean Hannity's just for saying that. For saying we need to give another people back their sovereignty. And at the same time, those people, when George Bush was doing the war, were there to protect their sovereignty and give them a new life and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, hey. whoever, that's why pl- politics is so stupid. And Mark Levin had a lady on that was uh, <laughs> spent time in Afghanistan, and she sat there and talked about how they were moralist dogs, and they beat women, and they stone people, and they don't deserve any sovereignty. Well, I guess we could be their sovereign. 458-TALK is the number. We'll check with the lines again here. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello? Good morning. Hey, who is this? This is Mark. Mark, go ahead. Uh, you already started off top of the hour with uh, a, a joint jurisdictional task forcing between the military and the police. Yes. Yes, we did. Go ahead. Are you there, Mark? Uh, hello. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Copy. Uh, has uh, the Patriot Act circumvented our uh, posse comitatus? Well, if it didn't, then the NDAA definitely did. No. Huh. Whatever they missed in one, they got in the other, guaranteed. No. And, we, and we've got somebody right here just a couple of blocks away from us today. Senator Lisa Murkowski, I believe, voted for both of those, didn't Ooh, she? Ooh, cool. And, she, and, and she, she's just a couple of you know, blocks Ooh. away from us right now in downtown Fairbanks watching the military uh, march 
through the streets of Fairbanks, which... Can we find out where she's at and go boo her? No, she's right there at the grandstands on 2nd Avenue. She should be easy to find. Who She'll is? be there next to the governor as well. Governor and, and uh, Senator Murkowski both are there today to... Um, that Parnell, he's a sharp cookie, let me tell you what. He called into the Alaska State Republican Convention and uh, gave us all a lecture on uh, liberty. Yeah. That was the biggest freaking joke I'd ever heard in my life. I was uh, appalled. It was just like, are you kidding me? You're going to tell us about liberty? I, I sent him a petition a year or two years ago about the TSA and begged him to do something about it. The guy won't do anything. The guy doesn't know first thing about liberty. But he got on there and he lectured us. True liberty meant... I didn't even... Yeah, I had this red fuzz going through my mind, so I didn't hear anything he said, really, but he was full of crap. <laughs> All right. You know, Four, boo. Boo <laughs> him, you know, too. Thanks for the call, Mark. 458-TALK is the number. You good morning. There. There's a bunch of... Hello. Good morning. Who's this? This is Jessica. Jessica, what's on your mind? Hey, you were talking about the consent laws and parental rights, and I just want to say that in the day now in this age, I really wish that we didn't need that consent age. I really wish that parenting went as far as um, you were talking about the uh, girl's parents should have gotten in trouble because they didn't know where their child was and that she had been dating this, you know, overage boy for um, a year and a half before they found out anything and brought uh, him to court for the consent laws. But unfortunately, I was actually involved in something like that. And because the state stepped up, and it wasn't my parents just saying, hey, you can't see this person. But the cops got involved, the police officers got involved and everything and said, hey, if you see him, he's going to be thrown in jail. I stopped seeing him. And you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened in my life. I was mad. I thought, you know, they are so wrong. And, you know, when I get turn 18 and da, 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 da. And I just thought we are going to live so happy and everything. And after the years went by, I, I met uh, met my husband, thankfully, but I couldn't believe how much I had changed and the maturity level from being that underage girl to being, you know, an adult. If I would have been with that person and I would have had, you know, had stayed with him, had the uh, state not gotten involved, had the, you know, officers not gotten involved, my life would be completely different. And I know I wouldn't be in a place in a happy place. I wouldn't be where I am right now. Okay. So, so, Abe, so, what Jessica, you're saying? Um, by, by what you just said, um, you're basically talking about how, as, as a young person, you were making unwise decisions, and uh, somebody came along and informed you that this was probably wrong and made a decision for you, and then uh, you were able to reap uh, a good result later on in your life, correct? Yeah. What I'm saying is... Um, Unfortunately, parents can only go so far because my parents had told me and told me, you know, not to see this person and had, you know, gone as far as they possibly could with trying to in- keep me from seeing this person. And finally, they got the state involved. Right, and when so- the state was involved, that's when I actually was like, whoa, I do have to stop seeing this person. Well, the, the thing that I see about it is I... I have children. I've made dumb decisions in my life as well, and and I've had people get involved. And when the state got involved with me, it involved my Miranda rights. Um, mm-hmm. So 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 I definitely know the the that powerful effect of this giant entity coming down and 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 putting something on you. But the problem is is why is it that that we give the state the power to speak into young young individuals' lives? Why isn't there not you know what 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 about a group of uh, you know I, I use the term elders, yeah. pro- probably wrong. Um, you, you know, I mean, I mean, your your parents or or, or an older peer group. I mean, there there, there are way better groups that that can speak into your lives. And if and if it requires law and and power of the state, then I mean, that's and that's that's pretty scary. Jessica, this is Steve. I, I'm I'm curious as to know why it was that you were not respecting your parents. Why were you not listening to your parents? Because I was at that age of rebellion. And so I really, they told me, you know, I couldn't see him, but I could still drive. I was able to drive myself places. And, and, isn't, and that, so, isn't that part of the, because the government has set themselves up as the arbiter between the parent and the child? Because the, basically the government has intervened and said that the parents do not have the right to tell you that you can't drive. That the parents cannot force you not to see someone. 
that the governor, that where the the government, the state, is the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong to tell you whether you can or can't do something. Isn't that really the issue? That, That's that, true, and it's sad because I feel like if the world hasn't wasn't so different from in the olden days, <laughs> back before I was born, back when parents actually were the stay all. Right, and I but, wish but it was still that way. That's the whole point. What changed? The state I decided. Don't know. The, the, the state. state. <laughs> The same people that you're advocating for is the only part of it that changed, and that was the point from the beginning. They've taken it from the parents and decided what's moral and what's right. Yeah, did you, did your dad have a 12 gauge? <laughs> yes, he did. Actually, well, if, well, if there wasn't if there wasn't a state for him to rely on, your dad would have taken care of it. And, I'm just guessing and, that. And, and your dad but, your dad would have been the power in your life, just like the state is the power. I mean, the the state was basically threatening to take your man away and throw him in jail, and, right? Against yeah. his will, by force. And so I, what if your dad had done that? What if your dad had had the power to do that and a power that was recognized by the other pe- people in the in the town and the village to say, hey, yeah, he has the right to do that. Aaron. And Steve had the best point there. I mean, the state yep. wasn't allowed to say what was morally right for your dad to do. He couldn't, right. he couldn't say you couldn't drive. It, it was never an issue of the state saving you ever at any point. The state caused the problem in the first place. Yeah, because the state was able to tell your father the limits that he could go to prevent you. And we're not getting down on you, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I'm definitely a different, up. different person from that rebellious uh, little girl. So. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's <laughs> just, hopefully, just, most of us are. Yeah. The, the point, the only point we're making is that the state restricted your dad's response to what you were doing at the time. Your, the state restricted your dad's response to the guy that you should not have been seeing. If your dad had ultimate authority and didn't have the state restricting him, because that's ultimately what it is. The state restricts you on one end and says, now we will take care of that problem. If if he had the ultimate say and the state wasn't restricting him, he probably would have taken care of the guy. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. All right, thanks for the call, Jessica. Appreciate it. Thank you. Four five eight talk is the number. That we go on to the We're next. We're gonna get call. some wisdom from Jim. Oh, I got. I just wanted to chime in a little bit. I think that we've got two issues going on with the last caller. One is that in our laziness and unwillingness to, you know, be parents ourselves, hmm. you know, our society decided to give mm-hmm. all those rights over to the the state, whatever society is and whatever state is. But so, in other words, we got a bunch of lazy parents who are willing to say, okay, well, I'm not going to worry about it anymore because the state's going to protect my kids. And so they don't, you know, the, so the dads go away from the shotgun stuff and whatever. Yeah. And in many so cases, the, the dads just go away and they're not they're not there in the exa- home in the first place to be a dad. Exactly. And then the other issue is that she's, she was 16, obviously. She said that she could drive. Well, at some point, you know, people are going to make their own decisions regardless of what their parents tell them to do. Mm-hmm. And... You were talking about Rothbard earlier, and he he argues that in his book that at some point you're going to make the decision to be an adult. I did that at 16. I left my house and got a full-time job and and got an apartment and whatever because my mom was going to go to California and I wasn't going to go with her, you know. So I think that hmm. of course well, people in that yeah. well, I don't know. No, yeah. People in that people in that position are going to make bad bad decisions. I made a ton of bad decisions when I was 16 all the way through you know early 20s. But the the question is, do we want the state to come in and protect people from themselves and making those bad decisions, or do we want individuals yes, to make their own decisions? Yes, we do, which is Good why point. we we enact laws like the texting ban. We have if, to protect people from themselves. If Jeremiah, if you would have moved out at the age of 20, would you have not made any bad decisions? No, I would probably. St- I'm still making bad decisions now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, poor I, yeah. I came here this still, and, and, and I moved out. Um, on my se- I moved out on my 17th birthday. I was essentially still 16. I moved. That's when I moved out. I made a bunch of bad decisions too. I came to Alaska almost immediately. First bad decision. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, but the point is, is, if I would have been 25 and just moved out, how would it be any different? Yeah, no. there's a little bit to that. What Jeremiah's saying basically is, isn't there a point when? Uh you have to be responsible for your own decisions. No, there's not. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually on the other end. I, when I turned 18, I was in college. Okay, so I went off to school, still under my parents' authority. Went into a state-sponsored school, Arizona State, party capital of the USA. Thank you very much. And I began to do things that I knew my parents would not approve of, but I was still taking my parents' money and using my, my 
my government funded scholarships to, you know, I did some schooling along the way. I managed to cram a four year degree into five and a half years. Uh, I, I, but a, along the way, I, on that entire time, I was never held responsible for my poor decisions. I never had to make any, uh, there was never any effect for my poor decisions. Every time I used the money that my parents put in my bank account poorly and it was gone, all I had to do was pick up the phone and say, oh, mommy, I'm out of money again. And the next day or even a couple hours later, I'd have more money to do whatever. They didn't know what I was doing with it as long as I was pursuing my studies. That's what is important with your life. Well, I'm kind of fine with that because at least it was you and your parents and you weren't calling the state up and saying, I'm out of money. I need some money. I mean, what Jeremiah was talking about is is uh, everything that we everything that, that's a problem. Why do people not take care of their children anymore because the state's going to do it for them. Well, automatically, if someone else is doing your job, you get lazy and decide, yeah, I don't really need to worry about that. If you don't, if you can sit at your home and collect 1200 bucks a month and not do a dang thing, uh-huh. you know, you don't have to work or anything, right. why go work? Well, it's I, pretty good money. You well, can, we've done we've done the same thing with charity, too. We just say, exactly. well, I'm not going to donate to charity or go down and feed hungry people because, you know, I voted for Democrats, and oh. they'll do that. No, 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 the or Republicans whatever, will do that, too. Or voted in for the Republicans. Look the at the thing. Van Trans program right here in Fairbanks. Wait, Republicans and Democrats who, are the same thing. Yeah. Who was it? No, no, think about this. Van Trans is designed for the elderly, for the disabled, for the people who cannot drive themselves around to be able to get from their home out to the store and back again. It's door-to-door service. Who used to provide that? Before the state stepped in and provided, or the, the borough. Churches Probably. Volunteer programs. Exactly. Yeah. Churches, volunteers, and family members. And now, who does it? State. Well, the borough. Very but poorly. But it, it's the government. Exactly. Well, state, we use that Well, word. and that's not poorly at all. It's actually very richly. $75 <laughs> per ride is what it costs the taxpayer. So well, yeah. Government always works out really good for government. It's kind of funny. But every time, in any program or anything that goes on, the government thinks it's working great. And it is for them. So we, we've had somebody on the hook here for uh, the last uh, five minutes or so. Call, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. And go ahead. Who is this? This is Al. Al, go ahead. What's on your mind? Uh, you know, speaking of the uh, texting uh, deal with the magistrate, two things that I you know, I observed from that court case was, is one, you know, he because the letter of the law didn't specifically state texting, he let the guy off. Now, how many people have gone to jail and then lost in court because of the intent of the law? No, that's a good question. And then second thing is it was a magistrate that did it. What's a magistrate's normal full-time job? I don't know. Stealing? I, I don't know. He's a, he's a defense attorney. He's a local attorney, and most magistrates are attorneys, you know, working in the community. Huh. huh. And so, I did not know that, actually. And so, yeah, they're not full-time magistrates. They have, they just get picked, selected, or they do it on the side as apart from their attorney jobs. All right, Al, we got about ten seconds left. One more thing you want to say? Well, you know that, you know that. Finally, a judge said, you know, the intent of the law is not going to stand in court. So does that set precedence for any other court cases that go on now? It should. Four four, five eight talk is the number. We'll be back with hour two. This is Patriots Lament right here on KFAR, a completely unrelated, totally separate show from the one that was just on the Saturday morning wake-up call. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, joining me in the studio this morning from Bighorn Enterprises, uh, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Also from uh, the other sponsor of the show, Far North Tactical, is Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And uh, joining us there in the <laughs> shadows, we've got Jeremiah. Good morning, Jeremiah. How are you? Good morning. Good. All right. Now, is, uh, is David joining us this morning? No. no. All right. Is he back off to some undisclosed location? No, I think he's sleeping. Oh, well. Good for him. All right. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Some of the stories in the news this week. You guys hear about the uh, the, ta- the tankers returning to Valdez that still have oil in them? Have you heard about that? Mm, don't know. Don't care. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just pointing out that in terms of our the, the lifeblood of Alaska being oil and how Actually, we have yeah, all, de- all depend did. on the, the state selling that oil down and, and refineries instead of making it into fuel that we could use here in uh, Alaska, well, they haven't had enough demand for it down there in the lower 48, so they've been turning it back. And they've now had five tankers return to Valdez with at least 300,000 gallons of oil still in the hull. Yeah, I don't think they have capacity. Oh, the refineries, no. They don't have enough room to put it all. Yeah. Interesting little tidbit. wonder why more people don't build refineries. Uh, might be because the government won't allow you. They won't give you permission, and we are too... 
cowardly to go out and do it without the permission. I say we. I don't have the money to do it. But tell, I mean, that, tell that to the guys in this town, even in this town, that have tried to open up um, coal refinery plants to turn it into synthetic oil. But what's happened to them? Um, they got tore apart financially. They got what sued? By the EPA, they got tore apart. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you got the government that's there to protect our property, using our property against us. Property as in money, so mm-hmm. steal, use it against you. Still Money's trying to figure property, out. Uh, the government <laughs> issued it. Still trying to figure out the uh, waiting for the necessity of the state to come up in one of these conversations. But why? Why do we? What? Well, obviously we need the EPA to protect us from the harmful things that coal does, like provide energy and heat us all. Yeah, not no. so much. Just well, like wood. Exactly. We need to be protected from the wood because, God help us, if we, we were able to go out there and actually heat our own homes without getting the government subsidy to buy the government-issued fuel. Why don't the borough have a cap on top of their smokestack? Isn't Why that, don't they? Yeah. Isn't that allow water to get down there and eventually corrode? And <laughs> Who enforces like the law in the borough? If you'd like to bring that to their attention, Josh, I'm sure they'd tax you to fix it. I'm sure they would, too. <laughs> Never mind. And they'd employ someone to go up there and, uh, you know, six figures a year to make sure that their sole job was to make sure that no water got into this. Probably thing. employ six people to make sure. They're probably doing a study on it right now, actually. $10 million well, that's study. The, that's what the borough does best, is use our money to pay the uh, mm-hmm. study the study and just research industry here in Fairbanks. It's the only real engine we have economically in Fairbanks anymore. <laughs> uh, the, Economic engines yeah. in the borough. Well, no, I mean, realistically, you think about it, it used to be gold, not anymore. It used to be oil, not anymore. Even even the military is a uh, it's a pa- it's patchy at best as to whether or not we're going to have uh, the military here from year to year. And so our our real economic engine is government. As a matter of fact, it's hard for them to spend money when they're deployed. Oh, that's true. Uh, you've got 59% of the 100,000 people that live here in the borough that are employed by government at one layer or another. So basically what you're saying, Steve, is that uh, since uh, 59% is greater than 51, and since in a democracy you need 51%, the government can vote itself gifts? Is that what oh, absolutely. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's exactly what I'm saying, is that we will never uh, have control of this borough because there are enough government employees who get their benefit directly from the government largesse, that the only thing that is going to happen is what's happening in Greece right now, where they we will actually completely physically run out of money, and there will be nothing left. Yeah, that's a pretty awesome. Actually, Greece, they spend 175 of their gross national product. You mean 175%? Yeah, 175% of, of, their, of their GDP. So all the so money that like, everybody in the entire country makes, they pay almost twice that. Out. Out. The the state does. Yeah, that's not what they're taxed. What the entire country makes, they pay, the state spends 75% more of that. So they decided that they were broke for some reason, and the people voted down the austerity. I mean, basically the people said, we don't care. Give us our benefits. Give us our money. I don't. You know, back in the day, the Greece, Greeks were like the brilliant people, right, that we looked at and, you know, read history about the Greeks and all their wonderful things they came up with. Well, they're pretty dang stupid right now, I'd have to say. I mean, they can't even figure out the fact that they're broke, and they have to be taxed to pay the benefits, but they spend 175% more than what they actually make as a country. Where's my handout? And they voted it down. Keep giving us the handout. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> that's democracy in action. Right this there. is what democracy looks like. Woo-hoo! That's what we're going for. <laughs> I was going to say it's probably also political evolution, too. I mean, that was 4,000 years ago. That's true. Hmm. They've been enlightened since then, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no one who could imagine spending that much money. You have to be really enlightened to figure that out. <laughs> 458 dog is the number. Uh, this is Patriots Lament. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Are you there? Cecilia. Hey, Cecilia, what's on your mind? Well, I was talk- I was thinking about all the laws that are made, and I think a lot of times laws are made, well, probably 99.9% of the time, laws are made to benefit someone other than the people. And I think a lot of times laws are made arbitrarily. I also think that 
Um, for example, I don't know, I was thinking about things like seatbelt laws and stuff like that, and I also recently bought a bicycle, and I went biking with my grandkids last week, and we had a great time. We didn't have bike helmets or anything like that, and I thought, you know, one of these days somebody's going to make a law, and I'm sure they have in some states, that everybody has to wear a bike helmet. Now, I was born in Holland, and there are millions of people who ride bikes there every day, miles and miles and miles, to and from work, to the grocery store. They have two or three kids on there with them, and they never wear a bike helmet. So, I don't know. I, I hate to bike. break it to you, but uh, Alaska actually does have a mandatory bicycle helmet law. Uh, oh. At least it's for younger riders. Wow. Uh, those under age 16. I'm pretty sure this is my mother-in-law, so in other words, my kids were breaking the law. Yes. Oh, wow. And I'm helping them break the law. I was going to say, on oh, top actually, of- actually, hang on a second. I misread that. That's only for motorcycle helmet oh, law. Is bicycle helmet use, there is no law in Alaska yet. Well, you, you, you were, you're probably still breaking the law because uh, you were probably doing it in like city limits, right? Um, yeah, okay, on Fort yeah. Wainwright, actually. And your and your bike hasn't been registered with uh, uh, the Department of Transportation, <laughs> has it? Well, mm-hmm. I'm in big trouble, and yeah. I don't really care. I well, actually got I actually got busted for that when I was 16 years old, and I used to ride back and forth between school and uh, my house because I I thought it was awesome to get up early and ride my bike to school. Well, I got in trouble because my bike hadn't been registered, and they gave me a fine. So for real, your bike? That's yeah, no. I, awesome. Actually, I th- I think I was lo- younger than 16 because I, I was in middle school, so that would is make that, me like 14. Is that here in the last? Yeah, that was literally from University West <laughs> to Ryan Middle School. That when I was, rocks. Yeah. Wow. That's so awesome that they're gonna find children for having unregistered bicycles. Well, we um, like to remind our listeners not to bring up ideas for new laws because <laughs> they will. They might be listening, and they no, they are listening. Is this whether or not they? Well, and that whole fine thing was definitely a result of positive rule of law because I think the whole reason to why they want you to register your bike is just in case somebody steals it. Right. 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 Well, I guess that's your own fault if you leave it out for somebody to steal. In some ways, I kind of feel like. There's personal responsibility again, and same with bike helmets. Mm. Hey, if you take the chance of not wearing a bike helmet, then you take the consequences only if one, it happens to you. Only one person ever gets stolen from. The state. No, the person on well, the receiving uh, end of the state. Uh, <laughs> because it, we create because a, if they didn't have the law, then they couldn't issue fines, and uh, yeah, that would take money from them, wouldn't it? Uh, it would. Here's on, a, on an interesting side note. Isn't it... Curious that none of us knew off the top of our head whether or not there was a bicycle law in Alaska, and it wouldn't surprise us if there were. It, what have we come to as a society that we do not know what the laws are? Actually, surprised me that there wasn't. Yeah, a bicycle helmet law. We and 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 think about it. If you and if you try to go hunting, you cannot mm-hmm. possibly know what the regulations are because they actually change while you're out there hunting. But as they say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, exactly. <laughs> it, it's like, um, what's your name again? Abe. It's like Abe said. It's all about positive law. So they create a law to keep, uh, to safeguard from stealing. But it doesn't stop people from stealing bikes, right? Right. So the only person that gets stole from is the people that created the law to protect themselves. Because the state is the oppressor. Exactly. It's no different than everything we've talked about today. Isn't that weird how it's always the same thing, no matter what topic it is? It's the state oppressing you. <laughs> there you go. I, Thanks very much for the call. It, okay. it, sure. it, Josh wears the best button in the world. The button says it's not left versus right. It's the state versus you. Bang. How is it every single topic that comes up, no matter who calls, no matter what we talk about, is the state oppressing you? It always is. 458-TALK is a number. Good morning. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello, this is Charles. Charles, Charles. what's on your mind? Hey, it's Charles the Poet. Happy Mother's Day tomorrow. Uh, Hi, Mom. Um, My topic is Frederick Bastiat, The Law. And in that essay, he makes a distinction between the government and the state. And the way I read it is we've gone clear past a good government and just drooling all over ourselves to have a state tell us what to do. A government... Uh, would be able to be controlled by a person or a group of people, and a state is beyond control and out of control and interested.
it only in the state. Is there a po- is there a way though to have good government and have it stay that way? I mean, because that was kind of with uh, Hoppy's um, whole deal with uh, democracy, the God that failed, was that even on the very ba- first basis of it is that the government's there to protect your property. But the only way the government can exist is to steal your property to exist. So how is it protecting your property if it's stealing your property to protect your property? I mean, to protect my property is to keep someone from stealing it. And the only one that gets to is the government. So are they really – is there a way to have a good government? Because ours was probably the the, be, the finest – up to that point, I mean, it was pretty amazing. Be- it, it was- began that way. A revolution cannot be immortalized. That's Chairman Mao. But uh, you, if you, when you have a revolution, you better be ready to take care of it after the fact that you just had a revolution and stay that way or keep it that way. Yeah, that's it's true. It's a problem. Yep. No, anyway, that's a good point. Ha- happy Mom's Day. Hi, Mom. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. Welcome to Patriots. The men who is this? Hello, this is Mike. Mike, what's on your mind? You said uh, 59% of government employees. 59% of the people in the borough are employed by government at one layer or another. Some of them are feds, some of them are state. 100% of their income from welfare? That does not. Those are not government employees. I'm only talking about those who actually get their active employment income from government. If you start adding in everybody who gets a check from government at one layer, I think we're at 100%. Because absolutely, no, not quite a hundred. No, do you get? Hey, do you get an Alaska permanent fund dividend? Well, yeah. Okay, that you're getting a check from the government, aren't you? But that is not my prime source of income. I'm not. It doesn't matter. You still get a check from government. That's true. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what he's saying is basically, if you take the 59 percent, there's that are getting the check from the government. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to see if I know where you're coming from. And then there's probably another 25% getting a check from the government that aren't doing anything. So that leaves about 15 to 20% of us that are actually doing something with our lives and producers in, in the society, producers in our economy, we're paying for all of it. Right. That was my point. That's what. Uh, that's why I was wondering if the welfare was included in there. No, it's, people, not people that just get assistance, but no, people that get 100% of their income from welfare. No, it's that the 59% are people that actually are employed, that actually do, well, well there's they do really about a, the same thing as most of them. Yeah, I was going to say it's pretty tech, hard to know if they're actually doing something, but 59% actually go down, punch a time card, or do whatever they right. do for the state here. In, so in let's say roughly maybe 10% in the borough do absolutely nothing, just get all their income from welfare. Well, from what I've seen, I'd say it's higher. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Let's just say 10. So even if it's that, then there's 30% of the population is carrying the right, rest of the society. Right, that we save. 30% of us pay for everybody. Oh, but that's not necessarily true. Now, that's to make, make sure we understand that a lot of these people are getting money from the federal government. So they're actually they're, they're not getting money from the rest of us. They're getting I money pay from federal taxes. Uh, now, you that's may pay federal right, taxes, the but they're taking, they're taking the federal money, right? money from uh, somebody else in another state. All right. If you want to get nitty gritty about it, uh, what percentage of New Orleans is um, on welfare? New Orleans? Yeah. Oh, Lord. That's got to be at least 50, I would think. It's right around 70%. So <laughs> not only are we paying for the borough to have almost 60% of the people on the government dole, we're also paying for New Orleans, too. So that's why this can never change, because there's more have-nots than there are haves. Well, it has to change, because those of us that provide and produce, we can only do it so long. Tell, for... tell Greece it has to change. Nah, tell, no, tell Rome. No, what happened? What happened when Rome fell? Same thing. Having to change, it does need to change. It has to change, but I think the only way it's going to change is collapse. That's where I'm leaning. Ah, uh, there it is. It has to collapse. Yeah, I was gonna say the only way to vote it in is is if uh, the guys who are paying for all these bills, aka us, uh, become a majority, aka over 51 percent. And that's I don't not, think that's that gonna can happen. never happen. Whenever you pay people not to work. Exactly right. Hey, go go back a little bit farther than Rome. Rome defeated a country that was much bigger than them, much, uh, way better resourced and all of that, and they attribute the fall of that country to what? And that would be Carthage. What What do they attribute it to? To democracy. Infighting. In Carthage, you mean? 
Right. If you look at what happened all the way to the day that the that Rome invaded, the day that they were burning their city down, they were still fighting over government money. They couldn't even organize the resistance against Rome because they were fighting amongst each other over mm-hmm. money. We were talking about at the break, we were listening to the news, unfortunately, and every story <laughs> on the news is something to keep us in fighting, right? The the, the serfs, it, something comes up about gay marriage, oh, or something comes up about the military or something, you know, all these little stupid issues that keep us in fighting because they know half the people believe one way and half the people believe the other way. So we sit here and beat each other up on it, basically divide and conquer. As long as we're worried about all these little issues... And the government just keeps on trucking, keeps on trucking because we're looking the other way. And some Republicans are very good at is put everyone in groups, everyone fight amongst themselves, don't pay attention to what we're doing, Mm -hmm. as long as you guys hate each other instead of us. We're looking pretty good. The Republican right owns all the airways, and they spend day after day after day causing that same strife. In fact, well, I think they do a better job of it than the left does. Yeah, and you know, if you actually listen to them, do they ever actually bring up something negative about the state? Like Rush Limbaugh or Hannity or any of those guys, do they ever actually say something bad against the actual institution called the state? They bring up different mm-hmm. issues like the against the left. Well, the left is for this, and we're the right, and we're for the other way. But they never actually fundamentally say no. the institution itself is corrupt. In fact, they, they advocate for using the state as a hammer on the People other that side. They don't agree the, with. the ones that they don't agree with, the ones that they think are wrong, especially if they think they're wrong on a moral level. And it goes back to what we were talking about in that show that came on before this one. It's completely unrelated. Mm-hmm. And just that, that idea that somehow you're going to take your moral convictions and impose them on someone else. Yeah, and, you know, people need to realize, and everyone that keeps defending the state and wanting the state, you know, well, we need this. We need... Guess what? It's going to disappear. We're a democracy. We will fail. And they always have. They always have, and they always will. So I think it's a good idea to get it in your mind now. Quit defending this thing because it's going to fail. This thing will blow up it's going to implode not from explosions from bombs and this and that but even economically it's over it might go on a few more years and we might do but we're at a 99 trillion dollar benefit payout right now that we owe we whoever we are owe to whoever they are whoever they are <laughs> just what is that that's the no. parade coming oh, by. there's a parade coming like by said, it is it is going to fail so where it, is my freaking everyone flag? should get themselves prepared now yep and just wait for the show to begin no. that's my comment <laughs> all right thank you all right four five eight talk is the number let's see if we can squeeze in one or two more here before the break at the bottom of the hour good morning caller who's this good morning this is natalie natalie what's on your mind today Hey, well, you've talked about so many great things. I, I, I've got a list. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Talk about the, the, the last guy um, who called in. There's a great video out there that'll show. It's called Vote Pump by Bill Widow. And it'll show that actually we could re- everybody could reduce the federal taxes, income taxes that they pay, and pay for every single government uh, building, service, whatever it is. It's the entitlement that are killing us, the debt, the debt servicing and the entitlements. That are killing us. Um, as far as you know, that's just at the federal level. I, mean, I don't think that we should have any of those institutions anyway. But we're paying for you know 75 percent of everything we're paying is entitlement. Wow. So I encourage people to Google that vote pump by Bill Whittle. It puts it real clear in black and white. How about the what? How, what's the percentage of entitlement for base versus services and entitlements at the borough? We're, well, we're spending a hundred and how many millions? Well, we, we, we're spending about, the budget this year came in at $141, $142 million. But, you know, don't let that, you know, don't worry about that because last year when the budget was $140 million, within the first six months, we spent an additional $7 million over that $140 million. Yeah, I remember that. What, what's, the, what's the uh, distribution, though, between services and... Um, entitlements. Just entitlements. Okay, you're going to get my opinion here because I think it's all entitlements to a point. Sure. Um, after about $47 million of that budget goes directly to education, the school district. But everything that the borough does is second class borough could all be done privately in the, the, the local market. No we don't We don't have police. Um, unless you're in a service area, there's no road powers that the borough does. 
all these things that people think the government is there to do, it, they just, we don't do them. The borough doesn't do them. I guess, um, more pointedly, how much money are those the borough just actually hand out? It has nothing to do with anything. Oh. They give to, I don't think they do any more, but like the ice parks or whatever. Well, they, Your local friends, of, basically. Yeah, a lot of the ice park money is, is, is passed through from the state. Now, this year, the state of Alaska spent per man, woman, and child eighteen thousand five hundred dollars per per person for the um for for everybody this this year and a lot of that money does come through the borough to go to what i consider to be handouts they, they call them named recipients yeah so I, you know i can't tell you exactly a percentage Take but a i guess. mean that, well, the, it depends. The majority of people, the majority of your spending goes towards 400 uh, people's um, salaries and benefits. So that's the majority of the budget, and I would say the rest of it goes to, about a third of it goes to maintaining, well, operating the parks and rec and the library and everything like that. And I'd say you're, you're spending about a third of the budget toward, you know, lobbyists and special interests. Wow. Natalie, cool. Natalie, doesn't um, the majority of our budget go to the school district? Well, $47 million of that $142 million this year, that's what goes directly to the school district. It's only about a third of that. Oh, yeah. And, so and, that, and that's not in the entire school. I mean, the school also then gets money on top of that from the state, right, and yes, from the feds? They, yeah, both the state and the feds. And so the school district's budget is last year, this year, it's about 250 Fifty million to two hundred and sixty million dollars. Wow! So the bro gives away about forty-seven million in entitlements. No roughly. wonder all of our kids are graduating high school with doctorates in physics. Yeah. All that money going and and wow, that's awesome. I, I wonder, love the results we get from all that money. I wonder how stimulated the economy would be if one they just hey. let, let the people keep that forty-seven million, or two gave it back. We're up on the break. <laughs> keep it here. All right, welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. I'm uh, Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio, in here to make sure that our sponsors get a chance to get their opinions on the air and also giving you an opportunity to sound off as well. Joining us in the studio from Far North Tactical, Aaron Bennett is here today. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Also from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett is here. Hello. And we've got a couple of other folks in the studio with us, Abe and Jeremiah. And on the phone right now, Natalie Howard. Natalie, you still there? Yes, I'm still here. All right, I, wonderful. And I, Natalie, of course, folks who don't know, she's one of the borough assembly members, one of the only three people who voted against the ridiculous reinsertion of $64,000. Is that how much it was? Into the budget to pay for us to take care of the dogs that nobody wants. Yep, and it's interesting because you have the assembly, a lot of assembly members were arguing that we're putting the squeeze to animal control and we've been reducing their budget and tightening the belt on them, though in three years we've increased their budget $500,000 and haven't reduced any positions. So I don't, that's the kind of logic you get down at the assembly. You get no logic. So same thing with Parks and Rec. We're going to cut Parks and Rec. Well, even with the so-called cut we made this year, their budget still increased $50,000. Could you have like a an, uh, a bid for the animal services? I mean, because what if I would have came in and said I'll take care of everyone's unwanted animals for twenty thousand a year? Well, this I'll is do it this for is free. this is something we we are looking at, and I, uh, Michael Dukes and I, and, and I think Diane Hutchinson are going to start looking into um, how to better do animal, you know, the animal control facilities because we actually we only have powers to go and like safety, go and pick up dogs, like stray dogs mm-hmm. that people are worried about. We don't have shelter powers. You know, you know, it's interesting, Natalie, if you look at the reason why the borough voted to give themselves animal control powers back in the 60s, it was because there were quite a number of feral dogs, dogs that used yep. to have been pets that had been abandoned that were basically roaming in packs and were attacking children. Mm-hmm. And instead of going out there and taking care of those dogs with a shotgun – or a 22, or whatever, they voted to give the borough the power to go and round up those dogs, but with the same intent, and that was to get rid of them. Exactly, and it's expanded into having a full-fledged animal shelter now, which technically, not in our powers, but allowed to happen. All right, let's get off animal so shelter. I, I really, yeah, I really called in about, um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you guys, because I have you know, had an experience in the supermarket yesterday, and I think it's important to to talk about what you talk about on your radio program to your friends and neighbors. 
I, I met up with somebody who I hadn't talked with in about three years, and I realized just how, how much your program has helped me to get to think more logically. And um, I really wanted to thank you for your, your program and encourage people to have those conversations, wow, you know, thanks. wherever they might be, um, because we're really in, trapped in these belief systems that bind us that don't make any sense, but we never question them. Um, the second, I wouldn't say nobody questions them. <laughs> well, well, that, that's why I'm thanking you all. I mean, you you really you really do pre- push the right amount to get people to start thinking about these things, and it's very important. Um, and I and I, I really appreciate the effort you 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 have gone to to have this program. The other thing I called about was this. Um, I'm so glad that Josh listened to Hans Hilman Hoppe lecture. It's a great lecture. He's really amazing. And on this Tuesday at the River City Cafe. At about 6:30, um, we're going to be discussing Hoppe essay. Actually, uh, the economics group, the campaign for liberty, will be discussing a Hoppe essay, and everybody's invited, and it should be very interesting. And then I really called in because I went to the assessors yesterday at the at the borough, and I wanted I wanted to get maybe even especially Aaron's reaction to this. This is this is on a handout that they give to the public. These are some informational facts the assessors give. Here's the first one. The capital system of taxation, commonly called property tax, is the way by which local property owners cooperatively contribute to the cost of public services. Nice. So that's, is that's, that is that like classic communist propaganda or what? I mean, did you get that out of, the, the, out of Marx's Communist Manifesto? Where did you get that? This is, this is when you go to the assessors and you pick up, a, uh, it says, what you've always wanted to know about property tax assessment but didn't know who to ask. This wow. is right at the assessor's desk. Now, now granted, I was, you know, the assessor department, is, they're, they're good people. They, they do what they're, the state has told them to do. Um, the, there's a lot of um, good information on what they're doing earlier in the book. This is on the last page. This is about little informational facts. Um, public services is more. Public services cost money. For example, we all pay for public schools, roads, fire protection, police protection, parks, and other public services. All residents of a community share these. And they, the things they list aren't even things that the borough does. The borough doesn't do police protection. The, right. you, you only have roads and, and, and certain service areas. You only have fire protection in certain areas. I mean, this is like propaganda to play or pay or keep the belief system going and make it you know, swallow that pill of property taxes. Mm-hmm. I kind of just take a little bit exception to one of the things you said when you said that they're good people because it reminds me of, uh, I was a good person, I just did as the Fuhrer told me to. They're not they're, good people. Why, I don't think any yeah. of them Why are. is your they're German Stephen actually from... a Mexican? He's got a Mexican accent. Yeah. <laughs> are you no, against I, integration, Steve? <laughs> you one of those people who don't I, like interracial marriage? Nothing I like more than sauerkraut and salsa mixed together. That is amazing. Well, I'd have to really scream to get a good German accent. <laughs> I was a good citizen. I just did as the Führer told me to. <laughs> Which we found in the Nuremberg yeah. trials. Were they good citizens because they did what the state told them to? No. So I don't like saying that these people are good people because I don't think they are. If you're a good person, quit your job at the government and go find a real job. I mean, but you, how far do you take that, though, Josh? I mean, one of the things, and Natalie, I, I have to say I really appreciate having you come on Problem Corner, Natalie, so because disappears. you have challenged my thinking. Because if you think about it, every single person who takes a government check whether it is payment from the government or whether it is a stipend from the government, whether it is a retirement or a disability payment or a benefit or even the WIC program, where does that money come from? Mm-hmm. Me. You know, there's something even more important decided at the Nuremberg trials. What they decided there by denying all these uh, men on trial the argument that they were just doing what they were told was they decided that there was a moral higher ground to disobey the state and obey your conscience. Now, we seem to all forgotten what was decided there, but it's very important to think about. They decided that you are not duty-bound to follow the state against your own conscience. 
Well, the state is our conscience now, though. I mean, everything we talked about since the beginning of the show has to do with freedom uh, of conscience, well, and, the, and the, the state, state has taken that just over. Just like it was in, the, in Nazi Germany, just like it was in Soviet Russia, just like but it is in communist China. This same government, actually, all the governments of the world at the time that were somebody's decided that a person does not have the moral duty to follow the government over his own moral conscience. But the same governments that decided that will oppress their own people under the same guise. And are. And are. <laughs> Wasn't that like Britain, so France, if, America? If you were going to use the Nuremberg trials, wouldn't you have to say that the people that you just call good people are not good people? Yes, and I have to I have to agree with that. And I think you guys put it really well. I, I, I While I'm here, I pulled out a, a great book I wanted to mention. It's the Hannah Arndt book it's called Eichmann in Jerusalem. And it describes this phenomenon that you guys are talking about. And she terms the, the, the term banality of evil, is what she called it. She didn't, uh, it was, a, it, this Eichmann in Jerusalem was about a bureaucrat in the, the you know, Nazi time. And it's, she, she talked about how these people, and she termed them, she the term the banality of evil. Do, are they even aware of the evil that they do. That's Eichmann. Eichmann in Jerusalem. Well, Eichmann in Jerusalem. It's a. It was a book, and, and Hannah Arndt was a, a, a Jewish woman, and and um, you know she argued, you know this this whole thing, pro and con about, you know, are these people, you know, are these people truly evil, or is, can we have something called banality of evil? It was. It's a. It's a. It's an interesting concept because. You know, how do you how do you deal with this? How do you it, deal with people who are, are are doing this? You have to look back to history. If the people weren't aware, if the individual wasn't aware, then why didn't the Nazis use the regular army to oppress to oppress populations? They didn't have to. It's not that they didn't have to. It's that they were too smart to. Hitler explicitly made sure that the Wehrmacht was not involved in any kind of death dealing at all. Mm-hmm. He only used the SS that had been indoctrinated time and time again, and they were brought into that slowly. Each individual, they had a program set up for destroying life. But you fast forward a little bit in their history to uh, Lithuania when they went into there, and you watch the videos that have come out recently that they're finally releasing to the public, and watch the Lithuanian people kill themselves mm-hmm. as the Nazis were coming in. You're telling me that the mass murders that they did with steel pipes, killing whole villages with steel pipes on video, that those people morally didn't know what they were doing? Oh, of course that not. That was but... absolute fear of the Nazi regime coming in. And it wasn't the Wehrmacht that had already went through. They'd already been through Lithuania. It was the death squads coming behind them that caused that chaos. Mm-hmm. That battle had already been fought and won. Natalie, any, any final thoughts before we let no, you? No, that's I think, lost, and whatever. I think great comments. I mean, I'm really glad you bring this up because where how do you point this out where mm-hmm. you've got people doing things that are 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 really you know bottom line stealing mm-hmm. and they're you know where at what point do we question what we automatically do or do for a paycheck you know? Yeah, exactly. So. Abe, Abe, were you hang on a second, Natalie? Abe, what were you going to say? Uh, I was I was basically going to go. Talk, talk to how, how is it that, that uh, so many people get tied up into the fact that taking money through taxation is uh, not stealing. And I think that the, uh, why that happens is because the government realized that the only way to take something back from the citizen is to create something, a.k.a. currency, that replaces wealth, that makes it really easy just to say, oh, yeah, well, we're taking it back. So the government owns a currency, so it's not stealing. Well, that's what they did with the Continentals. It's yeah. exactly what they did. They handed them out saying this will actually be tax money, so we're going to get it back, yeah. but here's your tax money during and then the that, revolution. And then that that removes the, you know, going, going back to what we were talking about earlier with, with, with Rome, that removes the moral uh, uh, barrier that prevents people from saying, oh, well, we're stealing. It's like, well, no, we're not stealing because you voluntarily exchanged over into this currency that you've allowed us to regulate, blah, blah, blah. So that allows us to do things. <laughs> Which would be fine if there was able to have competing currencies, but we uh-huh. don't. Right. So. Cur- currencies have been... Governments figured that out a long time ago. We were talking at the break about um, Spartans' uh, form of currency, which was huge, unwieldy iron uh, 
bits of currency, which obviously didn't have the wealth of gold or anything like that. But they, the Spartans issued an iron coin that was just gigantic. And the reason they did, instead of using gold or anything like that, is because it was incredibly hard for a wealthy person to get up and leave and take his wealth with them. They made them so unwieldy that they couldn't take their wealth with them. Hmm. Kind of what's happening right now with the United States, where you can't leave the country if you have unpaid taxes. All our money is digital now. Oh. Uh, Natalie, it's interesting with yep. all with all of this stuff here in terms of you, you talk about the value that people think they're getting from their taxes. Uh, at what point would it be right for me to take anything from you to give it to someone else? If I if I were to come in and say, you know what, I've got a poor person down the street that I, I think needs to have some money, so I'm going to go and I'm going to steal that money from you to go and give it to that other person. Wouldn't that be noble, Would that that whole concept of Robin Hood stealing? Yeah, Robin Hood told me it was. Right? I, I, I don't. I don't agree with I don't agree with that, but I, I got something else to throw out to you guys. I don't know if this is that we can maybe talk about this at another time too. You know, I think it's a, a lot of things that, that the government doing, but it, a lot of things are that the government or whoever is in power understands human nature better than we understand human nature of ourselves. And we are the only. I was watching a lecture on what makes us human, and we are the only species known that. And this is a summary of it too. Uh, we are gaining the strength and will to do something, whatever it is, X, from the irrefutable evidence that X cannot be. Human beings can hold two diametrically opposed belief systems within their mind at the same time. I'm maybe going a little bit out on a tangent here, but if you look at how human beings are wired, that's one of the ways that they get you to do something that is not factual, does not make sense is that a belief system can override, a, a commonly held belief system can override sense, and that's something that's unique to humans. Mm. It's how we can lie to ourselves. Yeah. And, it's, and, and if you have a group of power that understands this, like the, the Nazis and propaganda or whatever, you know, looking at history, that belief system can get a group of people to actually override common sense. And I, I, I banged my head, and I, I was watching these uh, lectures on what it is to be human from um, Dr. Sapolsky after the Royal Assembly meeting because I kept on thinking, how can these people say these contradictory things because they have this overriding belief system when they don't, they, they don't even look at the facts anymore? They don't even, they don't even look at it as, as, you know, we used to be sold the, the, the thought process that, you know, these politicians are stewards of your money. The staffers are stewards of your money. They don't even talk about it like it's even pretending to be your money anymore. Well, it's, it's not. If you get if a thief comes in and steals your money, he doesn't think that it's yours anymore. He goes and spends it the way he wants. It's not. Yep. It's stolen goods. It's their money now. They've taken it's, possession of it, and we let them do it. Yep, and they've gone so far that they don't even pretend anymore that they're stewards. Well, I think I think that it's interesting that we've we started talking about. Folks that work at the borough, and you know whether or not they're what they're doing is right or wrong. And then we kind of went to the extreme of, you know, the Nazis beating people to death with pipes. And it it seems to me that the only real difference is a scaling issue. You've got b- both those actions. Whether you're stealing my money or beating somebody to death with a pipe, you're infringing on it, an individual's right to their life and their property. So. But it's the interesting thing is is that we've been able to, or whoever has been able to convince us that 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 what the borough's doing because it's scaled down, is okay in some, you know, some way that that's all right. Legitimized. And so we say, well, there's good people down at the borough, or, you know, there's good guys marching right by the studio, you know, and they're just pulling the trigger, you know, doing what they're told to do. And I think that the that the way that we can change that perception is only through education and it's got to be something that people do on an individual basis obviously but with the guy mentioned the law earlier you know frederick bastiat Mm -hmm. and i mean he if we expect to change this at all in the direction of liberty we're going to have to educate people around us and in you know engage in learning ourselves because we're we're taken into a school system at a very early age that trains us basically that you know, to obey the state and, you know, oh, well, they were just doing what they were told, so it's okay. Kind of interesting how that ties into what we were talking about an hour ago about the parental rights and the issue of 
the age of consent and at what point the state has moved in to become the parent and the parents are pushed to the side. And how often is it because the parents are pushed to the side? How often is it because the parents have chosen to abdicate it? One, at some point, you end up in the same place, right? Mm-hmm. Thanks, Natalie, for the call. Okay, Appreciate what you, you do over there at the borough. It's a revolution of the mind, what? is what you're saying. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello? Hey, who is this? This is Randy. Hey, Randy, Randy. what's on your mind? Oh, oh, hi there. I'm at the, on my bicycle. I came down to look at the parade. I'm at the corner of uh, First, Aven- or First Avenue and Powell Street. It's It'll pretty really exciting. Clear. And um, it's really neat how they hand out flags. I get to have a flag and wave it and also shout out thank you for your service. It's really a great opportunity for people to show their appreciation for our troops. And then also earlier I saw a... A uh, looks like a mine detecting robot go by, so that might be at the uh, Pioneer Park. I'm going to go over there. I don't know if you can hear me. That uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Andy. It's interesting because we are less than a block away from each other here, talking uh, by phone over the airwaves. We actually hear the same guys that are yelling on your corner. They're yelling right outside our window at the same time. So it's kind of creating this little uh, vacuum within the space-time continuum, where in fact you're hearing something. 30 seconds after it happened already here, and yet we are hearing... Oh, it's weird. Uh, Randy, I'm, I'm curious. Are you going to and thank the robot while, while you're over there for its service? Because, I mean, right now, this is the way that we're going. I mean, more and more and more, we're using robots. We're using drones. We are creating a robot army to go out and uh, invade the countries that we want to take over. I mean, at, at what point do you think our military is going to be replaced by robots? But they should, the robots can certainly help in all tools. All these things are tools to make our military as effective as it can be to do as good a job as they can and, and, and to save our military's lives in the field. I got a really good way to save our military's lives is keep them out of the field. What? That's exactly what I was <laughs> going to say. You don't even need any robots for that. Keep them home. Don't send them over to stupid places like Afghanistan. Well, well, doesn't the Constitution say that we have a people, duty to export democracy? 77%, do. 77% of the people want the troops to come home from Afghanistan. Randy, why do you want to keep sending them back? I, I wish they could all stay home. And well, they could. Well, they could. They could. People like you didn't want to keep sending them over there to get them killed. I like them right here at Fort Wayne. Right, they do a yeah, good that, job that, right there, and they're pretty safe. Yeah, and they all like come into really my store, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I go down to Aaron's store here was a few weeks ago, and there's some guys in there just back from Afghanistan. And you know what they said? It was really blew my mind. They don't want to go back. What? Every single army guy that comes into my store says. They cannot believe that they're over there in the first place. Every single one without fail. But people like you, Randy, that say, Heil, Heil American flag, you send them back over there to get killed. There's a bunch of guys from right here that went over there. They got killed, and they got killed for nothing. Yeah, and just like those 7,000 that got killed on Iwo Jima, my heart bleeds for all of them, you know. I wasn't there, but thank goodness we had some people brave enough to go out and fight for our freedoms, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate when people stand up for freedoms, too. You know, I, you know Randy, I, I, I served for five years in the military. I had a chance to go and spend an entire year, 12 months of my life, in uh, on the ground in Bosnia, serving my country, oppressing uh, the, the, the poor people there. And uh, after I got back, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. I uh, ended up getting out of the military. And I, I look back on my time, and I'm really glad that I served. I'm really glad that I, ha- I had an opportunity to do it and to do it for my country. However, I began to question, even while I was there, the constitutionality of what we were doing. I don't hear that questioning coming from you at all. It sounds like to me, as long as somebody somewhere decides that they should go, that that's okay with you. I never served my country. I was never in the military, but Steve, I really appreciate the service to our country. I really appreciate that. All right, but you didn't answer you my support, question. I know that you're diabe- diabolically opposed, diametrically opposed, whatever, to everything that President Obama stands for. So you support Obama sending us back over into Afghanistan? Do you support his uh, the incursion that he did in Libya? How about, uh, the, what was it, Kenya? Where was it? Was you, Uganda? We Uganda? sent troops to Uganda? Where? Syria? You disagree with President Obama. It's about everything that he does. He's a socialist. So do you agree with him sending our troops back to Afghanistan? 
Well, I don't want to pull the rug out from Afghanistan. You know, once we started something, the people have depended on it. Uh, they want us to leave. They are begging us to leave. They want their sovereignty back. And 70% of the American people want us out. Democracy, you know, majority yeah. rules. <laughs> Randy, appreciate your phone call. Going to let you go. 458 Dog is the number. We only have a few minutes left in the program. Who's this? Hey, who is this? It's Cecily. Cecily, what's on your mind? I think that if, if um, the Christians wanted to follow their own rules, there wouldn't be very many wars. Anyway, it says, not that right. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Anyway. And that's your stealing and killing the unbeliever, right? Isn't that, oh, isn't that in the believe, Bible? Yeah, or, as long as they don't believe what you believe, then uh, yeah. they're bad. If they that's have the brown thing. skin, it's okay, too. <laughs> I, hope the, I hope the military boys get educated enough not to join the army and go kill and rape and steal. Thank you. Well, thanks for the call, Cecily. Four five eight talk is the number. This is Patriots Lament. Who's on our phone? Are yeah, you... this is Marvin. Marvin, what's on your mind? That uh, lady there, killing rape. He's a, another victim of the uh, the media, and I think we ought to go down and boycott the news me- the news miner to, to make them tell the truth. At least have some signs out there. Where is the truth? You know, so people will wake up to the fact that they're lying. Maybe that would, that might help. All right. You got a specific issue? Specific. Um, of course they. I mean, thank you. I agree. I right, appreciate the call. Uh, <laughs> I agree you know, a uh, bunch uh, of liars, but I just thought maybe he had a. Well, uh, it, it's interesting to me, though. I mean, if you look at it in terms of one of the reasons why the media exists is that people are willing to pay to have someone tell them what's happening. And normally, you, you'll find this principle happening that if, if it bleeds, it leads. That people what they write stories that are designed to get people to buy more copies. It just the same thing happens in radio. We put people on the airwaves that are designed to get more people to listen, and, and, and so we 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 end up feeding. Why did you bring us on that? Ah, well, yeah. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Well, there you go. All right, folks. We're at the end of the show. Uh, action points for today. I've written down three titles of books that have been mentioned that you might want to go out and get a copy of or read. And you know what? There's a a great little taxpayer-funded thing here called the library. You could actually probably get some of these books. Not uh, Barnes and Noble or something else instead, please. All right. Uh, okay. iTunes has a lot of good ones on it. All right. You can go there and download uh, stuff from Hop. And, there you uh, go. You can learn while you work. Democracy, the God that failed. Excellent. That's one of the books that was mentioned. Eichmann in Jerusalem was another one that was mentioned. And the third one, The Law by Frederick Bastiat. Uh, um, some of yeah. these are available for, for download. Some of them you can go and purchase at a bookstore. Go on the Mises Institute. Um, a lot of those are on PDF. You, 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 you can get them free at the Mises yeah. Institute, some of these. All right. I, and I, I'm going to put uh, the lecture I was talking about, yeah. put that up on our website. Which so is? PatriotsLament.blogspot.com. Oh, sorry, John. E- email address is PatriotsLament at gmail.com. So PatriotsLament at gmail.com or PatriotsLament.blogspot.com. And I still encourage people to read Whatever Happened to Justice. I know we keep hitting on that, but, I mean, it's a really good learner book to start. Just go read that, then come and argue with us. There you go. Exactly. All right. You're going to change your mind most for the most part. If you're out and about today in Fairbanks, keep in mind that the uh, traffic is probably going to be messed up for at least another hour or so uh, because of the big military parade going on right now. The salute to our military parade It's going to culminate here at noon with a giant picnic over there at uh, Pioneer Park. And uh, one of the the things that we do want to make sure that you understand is that we here at Patriots Lament are not anti-military. Sometimes some of the things that we say are construed by people as to say that we are, and that is not in fact no, the case. we're all about self-defense. Exactly. If and you're going to go to war, do it constitutional. Constitutional. Exactly, home. and come home, and that's what it's all about right there. Uh, we do appreciate those who have served, those who are serving. I uh, just want to remind you what we talked about at the very beginning of the show in the last hour, that aspect of you got to obey your conscience and, and not necessarily the legal orders that are given to you are they lawful orders ask yourself that question right on and uh, we will see you again next week at 9 a.m for the first hour at at 10 o'clock the second hour will be preempted by a live auction oh yeah here on kfar this has been the uh, patriots lament uh radio show exactly josh thanks for being here coming up next to itself doc And I will be back again on Monday morning at 6 a.m. for the Better Breakfast Show right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio. Make sure you check us out online, kfar660.com. And if you want to listen to previous episodes 
of the Wake Up Call or Patriots Lament. We'll find them on our website. You'll also find them on the YouTube channel, which is Radio Free Fairbanks. And uh, check that out as well. See you next time.